Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to yet another one of our excellent teaching with technology or teaching roundtables. Today, the EDC is very pleased to welcome uh, Gregory McIsaac to talk to us about um, one of his techniques in terms of marking and using audio notes. Um, hi, everyone. I'm just going to, um, what I want to do is give you a fairly short explanation of what I've uh, developed and then um, you can ask any questions that you want and feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, I want to begin by giving you uh, an idea of, of my motivation for starting to give audio comments on papers. Does everyone have a copy of my hand, little handout by the way? Yeah. Um, and then um, explain how this solves a problem that I had and then when, once we sort of see the motivation for it, then I'll, I'll, I'll take you through the steps of how to do it yourself, which I've put on the handout, so you can take that. Um, and and uh, I'll show you how some technical things about how I do it. So first of all, um, you know, it would be lovely in a perfect world not to have to grade assignments, but unfortunately that's not the case. And so um, um, I, I have... Uh, a real difficulty in in grading assignments in a timely fashion. Right? I find it very, very difficult to go through papers. The assignments which I give are uh, essay essays, obviously. I teach uh, Greek philosophy, so they're uh, assignments on, um, on philosophical texts. And in essence, the, the worse the paper, the harder it is to mark, because the more it's an exercise in pure memory. Right? If you have a good paper, then it has a coherent argument, and you can sort of keep the train, and and um, and it's fairly easy to do it. But if but the more the paper approaches fish, bicycle, I like this, right? Then it's just a pure exercise of memory to see what you know to remember what they said on page one. By the time you get to page five, it's difficult. So over the years, I've I've tried to develop techniques to to. Um, allow me to remember what came earlier, and this developed into a kind of an editing. This all came to a head about three years ago when I noticed that um, in the space of one year, the ability of students to write a paper uh, dropped precipitously, and I'm not exactly sure if that's been across the university, but in our program it was the case. Um, and uh, so I, I had to really think about, on the one hand, how to make my marking easier uh, less time consuming and also more effective, how to give the students uh, better feedback so that they would improve and, um, and that uh, not only would they do well, it would be subsequently easier for me to do it. So, um, so I'm going to get into very, just very briefly something outside of the voice the voice comments per se just because that's the context in which I developed this. So. I, I usually teach in the second year uh, required course in the Bachelor of Humanities program. This year I went and I volunteered to teach in the first year uh, required course. It's a team taught course. And what I did is I instituted a, a writing boot camp in first semester. So your typical first year experience is you in, in arts, let's say, is that you go and you um, have five courses. Let's say all of them have a paper due around November. You try, you don't know what you're doing, you get five bad grades or five mediocre grades and um, rinse and repeat for the next semester. So what I did is I made uh, five distinct uh, evaluations in first semester. So they had to write a one-page paper and then they had to rewrite that paper. Then they had to write another one-pager and then a two-pager and then a two-pager. And so um, they were constantly getting feedback and it's been extremely successful. We went from having 40% of the class in the C and D range to almost nobody in the C and D range by Christmas. But it's a lot of grading. Um, and uh, even though there are two professors, there's 70 students, so it's, it's an awful lot of grading. Uh, I was working 65 hour weeks. So we're hoping to get a couple of TAs because we don't have TAs. In any case, it would have been impossible had I not figured out how to to uh, streamline my 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 grading. So, in the context of giving um, more regular feedback, it also has to be feedback which will allow the students to improve from paper to paper. Okay. So, the question then is how to give better feedback. 
And obviously, the um, there's two elements to this. One is it has to be um, you have to be able to comment on more of the student's writing at a deeper level, and it has to be something which the student will actually pay attention to, and uh, and uh, and and benefit from, right? So. A few years ago, I developed this, and um, this was <coughs> okay. This was my first attempt to uh, to make my marking easier, and it's a set of grading codes. This is right, and they're categorized according to argument, style, grammar, form. They're really appropriate to a philosophy paper. Um, if you come up with something like this, it may or may not look like this. Feel free, I've given you the URL of it, feel free to, to uh, cannibalize this. Um, but the reason is that you know it takes a long time to write comments on the side of a paper, and you find yourself writing the same comment over and over again. So my first attempt was, well, I'll just give a set of two-letter codes, and uh, the students can will, will have a copy of this. So each of these codes is explained in five pages, Right? So, for example, flow. This series of sentences does not flow well. It may be accurate and well-organized, etc., etc. And so the idea was, well, I can give more feedback and do it more quickly because I need to right? put a line, flow, and so on. I'll show you what this looks like in practice. Uh, doo -doo -doo, temp. So, I, so we don't violate privacy. Do not look at the names there. Uh, you can edit that out later. So here's a typical paper, right? And as you can see, WW, AW, this is awkward, this is wrong word. Um, wrong word meaning this word does not mean what you think it means, and so on. And so sometimes, I mean, the worse the paper is, the more codes you get. And you can see how um, you can go through a lot more quickly than writing on the side. Um, the problem is that if the paper is the only feedback the student has, um, well, you want to make it intelligible to them. So I found myself editing the entire, I would comment on everything. So I ended up basically, instead of just, it actually slowed me down. It was taking 40 minutes to do each paper because I would mark everything because I was able to now. And that's one problem, it slows you down. The second problem is that the students have to go and look up the codes. And if they don't want to do that, then they don't learn anything because, you know, if they're lazy, they are AW, uh, I don't know what that is. PA, parenthetical aside, they don't know what that is. So I needed to find a way to solve these two problems, to make it more um, quick for me and to, in a sense, um, force the student to understand what the feedback meant. Probably wouldn't be fair to quiz them on the codes. Well, you know, <laughs> you can. Oh, it's, you mean like have that as your first assignment? Yeah, they have to know? That'd be really funny. Ah, cruelty, I like that. That's a good technique. So, so the audio Marking. So I decided, I, I was experimenting a lot with, with recording uh, seminars and recording lectures, and I thought, well, this would be a good way to do it, to give them voice comments. So the reason I've said this is because it's not pure voice comments, because for a year, as a replacement of this, I gave them voice comments and where I would actually read their entire paper into whatever recording device I had, commenting as I go. So instead of common, 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 but I would be doing it as I go. So they'd end up with very few markups. But I mean, that took 40 I minutes. Mean, it takes a long time to do that, right? So I would be giving them 40 minute long voice comments, right? As an aside, my students tend not to listen to their voice comments alone. They, they, because there are many tears sometimes, they tend to need each other's support uh, for them. So what I've ended up with is a hybrid system uh, where I'll go through very quickly with the paper using the system of codes, and I'll mark up the paper, but not in a way in which the student could understand it, right? I mean, they can understand. They, the, the codes now serve as a, a placeholder for the voice comments. And since I know what the codes mean, I can then, when I'm doing my voice comments, very quickly go back to page one and I can see. So. Since I since I since the main feedback is audio, all of a sudden I don't have to edit the entire paper anymore, and all of a sudden I don't have to, you know, in a sense, be as precise with the code as I need to be because I'm going to explain later. Right. So, what I've ended up then with is uh, giving giving voice comments, and this solves this solves both of the problems. 
because and this is time and comprehensiveness of feedback. I found that with this hybrid system of you have a paper, you go through it, you use you don't have to use codes by the way. What however you do a paper, right? So now we're getting into grade the assignment. Right? So however you grade a paper, you your your first pass through is some kind of shorthand so that you will remember what's in the paper so that immediately when you're done that you press record and you give an audio comment and you go back and, f and, and have some way of referring to the paper uh, yourself but also it helps if there's something on the paper so that when you're referring to things you can say page two, paragraph two, there's actually something there for the student to know. So I found that it takes between two and five minutes for a decent paper and sometimes about ten minutes for a bad paper, which is an incredible improvement in speed. I mean, obviously, you can grade papers pretty quickly if you don't give any feedback. You just, this is a piece of crap, see, right? But in actually giving feedback, so the first thing is speed. The second is comprehensive of feedback. Think about it, right? If you give even two minutes of, of feedback, of spoken feedback on writing, that's many times more than what you can write in the margin, right? Because writing in the margin is very small. If you give five minutes or ten minutes, basically what you're doing is you're forcing every single student to have a meeting with you about their writing on every assignment. Um, I'll get into exactly the, the character of the, uh, and I'll even play some for you, uh, uh, of, the, of the feedback in a second. Um, with regard to results and with regard to the students, um, their students' feedback, it's been uh, universally successful. Uh, with regard to results, I found especially combined with the many short assignments uh, this, this fall, but of course that's a matter of, I mean, the more assignments you have, the more time you're doing. I, I had, I, I, what is that? Well, anyway, I'm not going to guess how many assignments I graded in the fall, but it was a lot. Um, um, I've lost my train. With regard to, oh, yes. The, the improvement in the student's writing has been remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. I started doing this two years ago. The previous year, uh, the first year that I saw the, a real drop in the ability of writing, um, the, the four papers in the second year class uh, that the students were assigned, they did poorly on their first assignment, which was normal for this class because most of them haven't written philosophy papers before. Usually they, they sort of actualize their models, you know, the good writing models that they have by the time they get into the second or the third paper because we're saying, no, no, you just need to explain the argument, not give us your opinions about things, just explain the text. And in previous years they would they would get it. They had models. I found the students don't have that anymore. They, they think of thought as a collection of pieces of data, like on Wikipedia. And so doing this, and so that year was a disaster. The students did not improve. They did very poorly. The next year, giving audio comments, they improved amazingly. And this year, uh, in the first year class, they, it's unbelievable, the progress. So giving the audio comments, because of the level of detail, it really allows the students to improve. In terms of how much they like it, they, they are afraid, right? Because it's hard to, um, to, uh, to get feedback in your writing, and I have a tendency to be brutally honest. Um, try not to get annoyed. I actually have re-recorded comments because I realize that it's late in the evening and I'm annoyed. And I've, I actually have some, uh, some uh, voice recognition software which allows me to spit out a text, and it, you know, I've actually spent like a half hour converting my audio comment to text and reading it again because I don't want the student to despair, right? Um, so uh, they love it. You know, the feedback is creepy but fantastic, right? Creepy because all of a sudden your professor is in your room talking to you. <laughs> but they, you know, I mean, I, I teach a fairly odd breed of students. I regularly have students thank me for giving them C's because they learn, you know. Uh, but. But it does no good to give a student a bad grade if you're not telling them how to improve. And so they, they'd love this, this, uh, this way of doing it. Do you, do you have any idea of uh, how many people don't, either because they don't care or, or are scared or whatever? Um, 
As I say, I mean, the, the humanities program has a kind of an odd breed of student, and also they all know each other. It's a cohort, yeah. so I get the impression that all of them listen to it. Okay. If you had a class of 300 students, I would wager that there's an awful lot of students who wouldn't bother, but they would also probably be the same students who wouldn't bother, you know, uh, put it this way. The student has to want to have feedback. The student has to want to improve. Um, but uh, it's fairly easy to go to their WebCT, press play, and they, they listen to it. Okay? So that's the, that's the, um, the rationale behind it. Um, why don't I... Uh, do, do we want us maybe have discussion of that before we get into the nitty-gritty of how to do it? Or do we want to wait until the end for all questions? Wait. Wait? Okay. So, step one, grade the assignment. Right? So here's an assignment um, that I've graded. I have three samples, one in the C range, one in the B range, one in the A range. Um, obviously, uh, well, I'm, I don't think I need to put them all up. Obviously, the, the worse the paper, the more there is to comment on. Um, uh, I, I think that the two-letter system is good, but you can use whatever system you want as long as it's some sort of aid memoir for you to, for the audio comment. Don't forget to... Um, when you, uh, sorry, I'll take that on the next one. So, great design. Second, then record your, your comments. Um, and for me, because I teach philosophy... Do you have a copy of that? You got one? Okay. Um, for me, because I teach philosophy, uh, there's, a, there's a particular type of feedback which is useful to my students. Obviously, we all, uh, if it's, a, if it's a, an, a, an essay, want them to have uh, clear expression, good grammar, and so on and so forth. But um, their papers have to have really tight arguments. And so half of my comment is on their style, and the other half is on their argument, how coherent their argument is. Uh, different fields will have different things that they want to comment on. So whatever you think is the best thing to tell them, um, this is this is where it, you're free, right? Because you actually can just talk. Um, I have a tendency to do two things. One is to go back to the beginning of the paper and go, if need be, if it's not a very good paper, paragraph by paragraph, giving examples of, um, of you know, in terms of grammar, bad constructions. You can correct them. Right? If you have a, a sentence that's really awkward, you can say it in a way that would be less awkward. And so they'll actually hear, you know. I mean, it's, if you have a student who has no ear for grammar, it's very hard to teach them. They have to read and read and read and read. But at least they can have some idea of what you're talking about. Because if you just say awkward, then it doesn't help them because they don't know why it's awkward because they wrote the sentence in the first place. So don't forget when recording your comments to praise them when they do well. Because that's something which we almost never do, right? In the standard way of marking up a paper, you, you go for all the errors. Um, if if there's a particularly good argument or a particularly good, you know, elegant way of saying, then you praise them. That's and that's something which they've told me they really like hearing me be happy, <coughs> right? When when I when I have a paper that's good, um, um, watch your tone. Don't get annoyed, right? Because this is to try to help them not destroy their soul. Um, and and students can despair, right? I mean, they, I'm perhaps naive enough to think that everybody wants to do well, and they want you to help them do that. So, uh, do you want to listen to little snippets of one or two? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's listen to some snippets. I won't. I won't play anyone fully. Where's my iTunes? iTunes. Yeah. yeah. Continue. Okay, so um, again, ignore the names. Maybe I'll. S uh, the first thing is the student's name. So, uh, your this is uh, a C paper. The paper, your your expression is incredibly awkward. Over and over and over again, you use phrases, and I've marked them all that simply do not conform to standard English usage. Um, I'm not sure how you can fix this, because obviously if you write this way, you don't have the ear to hear how what you're writing is really awkward. The only thing I can say is to, to read it out loud and ask yourself if, uh, if these sentences uh, make sense uh, or if they sound elegant. 
and uh, or to have someone else look it over and to just be brutal with you and to tell you uh, to do what I've done and just cover your page with red and and rephrase things. If you're doing this in an effort to try to sound impressive, um, don't. Uh, but there are, for example, words here. For example, reclaim does not mean to claim again on page uh, one. Uh, let's see. Ensure against does not mean insure against. That's on the last page, and so on. Secondly, um, also in your introductory paragraph, you can just omit the first six lines. They don't really add anything. <laughs> and then finally, you give a, a narration of the three parts of the text, which I led you, uh, which I which I directed you to. But you don't really explain how they all work together. And so on. Okay, you get the idea. In short, uh, Socrates refutes... Okay, so okay. that's a bad paper. Here's a middling paper. Uh, let's say that is nice for philosophy, those of you who are familiar with that field. Yeah. But, you know, whatever your field is, right, whatever kind of feedback, the feedback in philosophy is if you just narrate, then you haven't explained the argument. If you're in history, if you're in English or whatever, what, the feedback will vary depending on your, on your field. This is not a bad paper, um, but there, is, uh, there are a number of places where you're writing this. This is a 12-minute comment. I will read a few of these out. I've marked them. And there's a general comment that I have uh, about how to oh, sorry, this is the wrong improve one. your paper. Mm -hmm. And the two are related. I apologize. This is the one I want. Paper then then is what philosophers know in Plato's Republic. Eric, this is not a bad paper. Um, there are a number of places where you have awkward phrases or where you use a word which does not mean what you think it means, but that you don't use wrong word. Um, in general, your presentation of this section of the Republic is, is not bad, but I, it, it, reads, um, it reads in a way as if it's a bit rambling, um, and sort of like the particular comment. parts of the text are not well integrated in your argument. Uh, in particular, your discussion of the Mino is simply just thrown in to the paragraph which ends page two and begins page three without any explanation whatsoever as to how it fits uh, with the uh, set of the material from the Republic. So and also your discussion of the analogy of the sun at the end of page four and beginning of page five, you just launch into it without any uh, explanation, and you really just give a crazy of it, you don't explain it. So that's a paper where the components are not bad, but they're not put together all that well. And then we have, again, Mr. Plato's Republic. Adam, this is a, uh, an excellent piece of work. It's oh, wait, sorry, wrong person again. It's this person. Notion of justice. This is an exemplary paper. This is excellent work. It is elegantly written. It is persuasively argued. It's complete. It's accurate. It goes beyond what I asked for in the question to situate uh, this, these passages within the argument of the book as a whole. It is fantastic work. So I'm uh, very, very pleased. I do have one comment in terms of your argument, um, and this is a craze. You've shown me something which I hadn't quite seen before. Your, your um, point on page four that Glaucon's account of justice so, is a sort of contract in a, in a way. So a student who gets an A or an A plus usually would just have the grade, right? They wouldn't get any feedback. Well, now I can basically praise her for three minutes. And th I did learn something from her paper. And so, you know, so she now knows that. So those are examples. Um, I, I f one thing I would like to improve is I would like to be... Um, Put it this way. You press record and you're thinking. You can tell I'm a bit slow. Obviously, your style will be different. But as you can tell, even just from those samples, the amount of feedback you can give is many, 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 many times as much as you can give either in the margin or even just a written comment at, at the end. And it's, it's less time consuming, too, than, say, typing them out and so on, at least for me. Okay? 
Now, I don't need iTunes anymore. I don't need Preview anymore. I don't need um, that. Yeah? Why, uh, do you have any thoughts about why it would be better to do it at the end rather than pressing pause and doing it as you You can do that too, if it works for you. Um, I think it's probably quicker to do it all in one shot. Mm -hmm. Um, if it's, for example, if it's a longer paper, if we're getting to a 15 or 20 page paper and I've, I've graded them long papers that way as well, I think it's more appropriate to do it that way. Um, I, especially since it's a, um, you know, what I'm looking for is not only writing style but coherence of the argument. I want to sort of see what their overall argument is before I start to give an evaluation of how each part fits into it. Um, but if, if it's more appropriate either because of length or because of the genre of writing to do it as you're going along, then whatever way works for you. I mean, you just press stop and, and then continue, right? Because the software doesn't let you put any markers in, like if you said page one, page two, page three, and then in that little side moving thing, mm -hmm. page one, page two, page mm -hmm. three, stuff like that. Not what I use, but if you can find a piece of software that can do that. I mean. Basically, what I want to do, you know, when we get back on the train, is to show you what I use. But, you know, from here on, the next step is give them the file, right? And um, and uh, if you, I mean, there are. Uh, I'm thinking of, of of developing a system where they submit their papers by PDF, and the audio file is actually part of the whole deal. Um, I don't know whether that's easier or not, right? I mean, I don't know what the file sizes are. I don't know, I mean, uh, whether it's even better for the student to have to then, you know, here they just press play and they have their paper in front of them and they kind of have to sort of sit there, right, and, and take it. Whereas if you have a comment for where they have to press play for each thing, on the one hand, it's, it's easier for them to sort of know what's going on. Um, on the other hand, will they do that for each one? and how much of a synoptic view will they have. So the strength and weaknesses of both. Perhaps, ideally, you would have a comment at each section and then a global comment, but then you're getting into a lot of work, right? A lot of work. The weakness of this is that they don't have it written down, right? I mean, ideally, I'd use my transcription software and give them a, a printout as well, but uh, you've got to ask yourself, what is your average student going to do? Normally, they get it back, look at the grade, and throw it in the trash. So at, so at least... Having and also you've got to ask, well, what percentage of their feedback will actually sink in? And so they're going to end up with sort of an amorphous idea anyway. So I think giving them two to five minutes of you have to just listen to me and here's what's going on is, is at least in my students, been fairly effective. But as I say, I have to teach in a peculiar program. The students actually all come to class and they read all the books, right? Um, I mean, if a See, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't buy them a, l a lunch, right? I mean, it, if the student doesn't want your feedback, no matter what you do, I mean, you can jump around and have flashing lights, you know, but it's not going to do any good. Yeah? Have you noticed any change in the number of students who come to you for, uh, in the old system and your new system just yeah. saying, you know, I've got your feedback, yeah. whether it's written or audio, um, but then I still don't get it? Uh, I don't know if it's related, but I have noticed that the students come to my office hours and, and outside of office hours much more than they used to a few years ago. But that may simply be because they're not doing as well generally, right? I mean, if you have a class where, let's say, you have 50 students and you've got, well, in humanities in second year, I mean, they, they have to have a C-plus average uh, to get into second year, and that's on academic probation. So you get to, if you get a class where basically everyone's getting in the B and A range, they tend not to come to you. But if all of a sudden you have a class where you're handing out, you know, 40% of them are in the in the C, D, and F range, and and they're going to be booted from the program if they don't improve, then they come to see you. So, but when they come to see me, they, I will say this, they have a lot more of an understanding of what's wrong with their writing than they previously had. And it helps me, too, because you have a student come to you, and if you haven't already done this, you have to, in a sense, do what I'm doing with them cold, right? Oh, I remember this paper, and you have to read it again, and it's very time-consuming, whereas, you know, you're meeting with a student, if they come to you, is already, right? You've got the codes, you can re vaguely remember having, you know, you, again, it's about memory. I have a terrible memory. So not only have the codes gone through my hands, they've gone through my mouth and through my ears, not the codes, but the feedback. So I generally remember the student's paper better, and I can, 
And, and sometimes they come and they don't quite understand what you meant, but then you have something to, to begin from, as I said, right? And you can give more examples. So, so yes, it's helped, actually, in student meetings. Well, it could be, too, that they're coming to you because they feel somehow like less intimidated after they've heard your voice. I don't know. If there is that. I mean, I have, um, in our program also, we have weekly discussion groups. So I see the students. It's team taught, so I see every student every second week in a 15-person or smaller group. So I get to know them pretty well. Um, but, yeah, it's intimidating. I think you're right. I think that they're scared, right? I mean, they they want to do well. They're, they're, they, they're, um, they're afraid of not being as smart as their classmates. And um, I, think, I think it does break down the the fear of coming to talk to me. In a sense, put it this way, I've already told them the writing is crap, then they've, you know, their worst fears already come, come, right? So, uh, so then they can come in and talk. Yeah? Shall we move on to how you actually do it? Um, I, so you can record your comments however you please, using whatever you want. I, obviously, I use a Mac. Um, I used to use GarageBand, and GarageBand is fine. I th it's overly complicated for this task. Any recording program will be fine. I actually use either an iPod or an iPad, um, and there's a little, fantastic little recorder called iRecorder. It's this little white square with a red dot. It's very simple because all it has is record, pause, and stop. And um, you, trans you can transfer files uh, wirelessly back to your computer. I actually use this to, to record all my lectures, too, because I want to know what I thought when I'm 80. I want to know what I thought when I was 40. Um, and uh, the one thing I would say, however, is uh, uh, save them in MP3 format. Um, if, you're, if, the, if the program you're using saves them in WAV or AIFF format, these are very, very large files. Um, and so it takes a long time to upload and takes a lot and they're just cumbersome to work with so uh, iTunes for example you can convert uh, files to mp3 format and I have the instructions on this little sheet that I gave to you on how to do that it's under advanced and create mp3 version um, if you use a different program or if you're on a PC um, however it However, I can't help you really with PCs because I don't know how to use them. However you do it, you come up with uh, a set of MP3s. Um, I, would, I would advise you to, to name them with the last name of the student. Um, I, give, I say last name, first initial, and then a number depending on which um, assignment it is in the year, first, second, or third assignment, for the simple reason that later you're going to have to restrict the um, access to that file, and so you need to know which student it is in order to choose the right restriction. Um, okay. iTunes and the Mac is very easy to use because once you've loaded all of the, pro the things into iTunes and you sort them and you've made MP3 versions and you sort them according to the date added, all the MP3s end up being up at the top and then you can just drag them into a folder. You need to have them in a folder on your computer so that you can access them from WebCT. Uh, this might sound silly, but uh, do you is your music collection now populated with a bunch of comments? Once you've dragged them into a folder, then you can erase them from iTunes. Okay. Yeah? Uh, I found that I was running out of space on my hard drive, and it's because I had all of these WAVE uh, or AIFF files uh, populating my iTunes. And so I just went through and I purged them, but I made sure I still had the copies. Of them. Help, it'll help you, too, by the way, if you ever have to make a, uh, to give a recommendation letter, because you can go back and listen to your comments, right, years later. Um, so, I mean, this is one drawback, because you're going to end up with a lot of audio files, and depending on how big your hard drive is, you might end up chucking it up. You might want to use an external drive or whatever. Okay. So, create the assignment, record your voice comments, some tips on recording method. Then, obviously, you have to distribute the MP3s to the students. Um, I, it took me a long time to figure out how to do this. Even in MP3 format, they're too big to email as attachments, mostly. Um, that was when I was using WAV files, maybe MP3, I don't know what the maximum size of an attachment is now. Bandwidth is going up, but if you can avoid sending out, you know, two or three hundred megabytes of attachments, it's probably not a bad idea. Um, burning a CD for each student is crazy. 
So unfortunately, I've been thrown back on WebCT, which I hate um, because it's clunky, and I'm not blaming anyone. Hopefully, we will have a better thing. So, what's so? Here's how you upload them to WebCT, and I'll talk you through it and show you at the same time. So you log into WebCT, okay? And I'll go to one of my do 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 classes. Fall. Okay, so what's that? <laughs> just saying, one of the things that we you just demonstrated one of the problems with WebCT. Your class list is oh yeah, so right? gazillions so, of things. Yeah. It's great because if you ever want to go back to something you previously yeah. taught, but of course reading because there's no separation by term. Like you got to read each one. Got to read each one, and plus also you since there are one of the things there are four tutorials. Right? Uh, with my class, I have to list like six different... Anyway, so here we are in WebCT. Here we are in HUMS 2000, Reason and Revelation, a survey of ancient and medieval philosophy. Wonderful stuff. So, first thing you have to do is to uh, upload the files. Okay. You need a place to put them. So you need to make a folder. I have a whole bunch of folders. How do you do that? Create folder. So if I wanted to, I could press Create Folder. Well, a new folder would appear, right? I think once you do that, you're automatically in the folder, but if you're not, then just go into the folder. Also, you have to be in the build, right? the build uh, tab. How many of you have never used WebCT before? Okay, you need to make a course first. It's fairly easy. Ask the people here to help you do it. Basically, once you've made a course, don't tick any of the options except basically you got the, the course. You're, this will be just a place for you, right? And so you'll end up, and this will be blank. And so this is a place for you to put stuff. So you make a folder. Okay, then let's say we're in one of the folders. Let's go to the Plato Voice Commons. Okay, imagine there's nothing here. So we have a place to put the comments. Now we have to put the comments in that place. So you do that. So imagine there's no files. By add file. And this is all written down on the instructions. So you go to add file. Okay, add the file. Browse for files, because you want to take the files from your computer and put them up here. We go into browse for files and we get this awful thing. <laughs> what the hell is all this? Ignore it all and go to my computer. My computer, all right. <coughs> and we have an upload dialog. Again, and this, you know, I hate to tell you, the hardest part of this is that you cannot either batch upload or batch change the restrictions. So if you have a lot of students in your class, you get pretty fast that click, 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 but you're going to have to do this for each file. Right. So. Is it? Yes. It's called WebDAV. It's batch upload. What is it? It's called WebDAV. Yes. If for the purpose of this, we can make your life easier moving forward. And anyone else knowing if you have a whole bunch of files that you need to get into your into WebCT? Web we can show you how to do that. Oh, fantastic. Okay, well, let me finish this, no, then maybe you can come and, and sure. tell us how to do that. Sure. Okay, so if so, this is a better way. Currently, what I have to do is, you know, choose file, go find the file, where am I? Play to assignment, go find an audio file, hit choose, you know, and then the file name will be there, then I have to do it again for that one, do it again for that one, do it again for that one. And then once you go down to the bottom, you hit OK, and then you basically go and get a coffee. <laughs> if you're at school, it, it's actually pretty quick. If you're at home, it'll take an hour. Um, so hopefully this step will be replaced by an easy way to batch upload. Because if you batch upload, then you've got all the files there. I would imagine then that you would, instead of going to my computer, go to class files or wherever it is that they, that they get stored. OK, great. Now you have the files up there. Okay, so let's imagine I got all, so now I have all of my files up there. Now what do I do? Well, all these files are currently visible to all of the students, and you don't want all of your students listening to each other's comments. So you need to restrict access to the files. Is there a quick way to do that? No. no. Okay. Sorry. So you do selective release, and that's down here, selective release. It sounds almost purgative, right? Sorry, that was a scatological joke. So, so there we go. You hit selective release, 
and you get a little tree with all of your folders, right? And so you choose the folder where you put all the stuff. If this is your first one, it'll be the only folder. And then you expand it. And you get a list of the files that you have uploaded. Okay? And the, when you go into it, instead of user ID equals, you will have set release there, right? So you use that to restrict access to the files. So let's go and let's imagine I was, I'm not going to actually do it, set release criteria rather. So you go into set release criteria and you want to add member criteria because you want to basically let, to, to say, well, only this member of the class can see this comment. So you go to member criteria, right? And then you get this little dialog box. Um, what you need to do is, first of all, go down to the bottom of the dialog box and select all so you can see all of the students at the same time. And you do the green button so you can see all of them. Notice they're not in, they're, they're, they're from their first name. I always hit last name so that they can actually find them efficiently. And let's say that I wanted to give a comment to this student. I would click that student. Then I would hit, hit save. But I'm going to hit cancel instead. Then I would hit save, cancel instead. And then that student now has user ID equals their name. You have to repeat that for every single file. And, but at that point, then, if you have student view, let's say, your student can go in. Oh, I can teach. <laughs> see, student view is empty, right? Because I'm not one of the students. And they'll see this. And then they can just go like that. No, they can only see their file. And they can also, once they go in there, uh, I believe they're able to actually download it. There's a way in which they can download it. I think once the bar fills up, they can press control click or something like that and, and hear the whole thing. So, cumbersome. This last bit only applies to WebCT, which will be replaced soon. And there's an easy way to get it. So, all of this was you know, the technical stuff of how you have to do it now, but uh, hopefully it will be easier in the future. And there you are. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Isn't there any trouble with students um, saying that they can't hear it? Um, there were a couple of, excuse me, hiccups at first, um, but they seem to be, I don't know if I wasn't doing it right, but um, I, I, not really, no. Um, and if, if so, then if that student, for example, I don't know, doesn't have a speakers, well, if they don't speak on the computer, it won't help them very much. Um, if it's only one or two, you can, you can email them, right? Or, or they can say, come to my office with a memory key and I'll give you the, the thing. But you have to be prepared to problem solve on a broader level because there may be some problem with their computer in terms of hearing things or their speakers. Well, put it this way. If you have students who, I mean, simply have don't have the capability of, of listening to an audio comment, then don't give them an audio comment, right? Or, or if they can't download or something like that, then you have to make other arrangements. But, in, but I, uh, my guess is that most students are wired at the moment. Yeah. Um, Greg, just logistically, do you give, do you have all this uploaded and the grades entered and then the next time you see them or training? Yeah. Uh, what I usually do is I send them an email, which of course you can't do through WebCT. I mean, you can, but they won't get it. So then you have to log out and then go into my Carlton and then go to the class list and then send the, however it is that you send your class an email. I let them know that uh, the, the uh, comments are uploaded. Um, I mean, you can just give them back and they know at that point. But they, but they, they start to know, right? So they, they start looking, and so it's just easier to let them know um, uh, beforehand. Um, I tried that, but it goes, but they have to have, web, it's WebCT mail. And I don't want to have like an additional mail thing that I need to check. If you use WebCT and you have your students using WebCT and they check their WebCT mail or forward it to their Connect account, like that, then sure, you can do it that way. Maybe a question more for Patrick, but are we switching? I'm on sabbaticals, so I'm a bit out of the loop. But are we switching out of WebCT? 
The plan right now is the university is evaluating three different learning management systems okay. where decisions going to be made in the May time frame to what product we're moving to and it would be implemented for September and there would be about two full terms would be running both systems concurrently. So there okay. would be uh, the ideas in September, uh, the fall term and the winter term we would be migrating um, and ideally the more instructors and courses that we get on, the earlier the better it is, but there would be that eight month period of time to migrate. Uh, are we able to know which ones we're considering? Yes, um, and actually if you're interested in um, participating or trying any one of the systems, please let us know. Um, we're trialing a Desire to Learn, which is a Canadian based company. Um, recently they've made a lot of inroads at other Ontario institutions. Um, it's a commercial product. Moodle, which is an open source product, it's probably the most used learning management system in the world. Um, and Blackboard Learn 9, which is the product that the vendor of WebCT is recommending to move to. So those are the three products that we're choosing. And Blackboard Learn 9 still has the largest market share um, in North America, although they are losing substantial pieces of markets here and there. Okay. Um, but we will have a, those are the three that we're trialing and those are the three most significant learning markets, uh, learning management systems in the market. But there will be an open RFP um, and so I expect we'll have probably about a hundred different vendors that will be uh, trialing. But we expect that it'll be one of those three products that we choose. So no matter which one we choose, we'll be able to, to use it to do something like this? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I can get my oar in for a second, the and I'm sure Patrick, you already know this. The problem with something like WebCT, and and it's also the problem with Banner, uh, and I, I curse the I know one of the people who decided to get Banner, um, is that it, it looks like it's web, it's a web interface, but it isn't because it predates the web. Banner does, and so it's just extremely awkward and unintuitive to do anything. Um, also, it's it's you know it, the interface is designed it seems by techies. Right, so it looks like Windows 3.1, and you know it's just completely unintuitive. And so I'm hoping that whatever we uh, that whatever we get will have you know things like drag and drop, and 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 just be a much 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 better interface. <laughs> yeah, a key thing which you've already identified is this um, lack of communication within our email systems. Um, I, I, I'm at Queens right now. Um, do some coursework and they use Moodle, which I think has issues too. It's not perfect, but one of the things is that if a prof sends out a message, it goes to your Queen's email as opposed to having to take the other step of checking WebCT. I'm sure you've heard this, but that sort of intercommunication would be fabulous. We've heard both. Um, and so in our needs analysis, um, we've heard some faculty members say, I love the idea of compartmentalizing. Um, other faculty members say, This is ridiculous. Like, I have to check multiple. If I'm teaching, you know, some instructors are teaching three different courses per term. It means that I have to go into three different classes to, to check. And this is ridiculous. And my you know, work email, this is ridiculous. Uh, it is an absolute important item that we have is an integration between. Ideally, with it left up to the instructor to choose whether they have to keep it internally or go externally. Um, we're not very optimistic that the system's going to give us that option but at that level, uh, but it is absolutely what we've been hearing a lot of uh, from both sides. Any negative feedback or complaints or comments in terms of going down the street? They cry? <laughs> they really no, cry. I've, I know. Um, not really. I mean, I have really haven't. The the most, the only negative was creepy. But you know, who can fathom the mind of a seventeen-year-old? Um, uh, it's so not feedback, but I would say caution. You know, be aware that this is a lot more personal than comments written, right? It's and it's very. A 17 and 18 year old is going to take a judgment on his or her writing to be a judgment on his or her character. And so you have to really be aware of that. And um, I mean, this is just standard grading stuff, right? Uh, it's a lot better to say, here's how you can improve your paper, 
or this is what you need to improve, then um, this is what's bad. And you, you know, we sort of know that anyway, but when you're actually saying it, you realize, ah, yeah. You know, your aim is to help the student improve, not to crush their spirit, as tempting as that is. But on the other hand, you know, if you have a student who's obviously just phoning it in, then the, the added personal uh, bit can, you know, sometimes it's appropriate to be harsh. Because, you know, uh, for a lot of my students, this is the first time they've ever got honest evaluation of their work. They're good students, they sail through high school being praised, and they come to me, and I'm like a brick wall, and I give them a C or a D. They've never had a C or a D before. And I tell them this is just unacceptable, this is not standard English. And, uh, you know, and they were happy because they've never had real feedback before. So it's, you know, it's about, it's your personality, but you've got to realize what you're doing. Yeah? It's, I guess, more direct to Patrick, but Patrick, let's see, um, working in the national security area like I do, one can imagine that it might be not be unusual in a sense of student uploads it to Facebook or somewhere else and go, did you hear this to what my prof said about me? And then suddenly you were failing the global mail from page text or something. How's the university? I mean, I think this is a great idea. I'm sort of really tempted to try it myself next, mm -hmm. next year. But there's also thinking it through is a sense of, okay, what happens when this comes to the attention of somebody higher up? And it gets judgment, well, you were too harsh. You shouldn't have used that word. You were upset that wasn't like that. How's this likely to play out in your view with a much broader perspective? Um, I want to speak to that too. Okay. So my own perspective, I don't think it's much, I mean, obviously it's a far more personal feedback than, you know, codes on a page, yeah. right, or written comments. And so um, my hope is that if a, stu a student complains, and let's say it goes to the chair, right, and the chair listens to the comments, that the chair is going to realize that they're missing the context, right? Um, they're, they're missing a far broader aspect of it. And my hope is the chair is going to listen to the instructor and situate that. Now, that being said, you know, I like to think that most chairs are very aware of context, and at least the chairs that I've interacted with are very supportive of of faculty members marking practice. That being said, I've also heard some chairs who have um, been less supportive. Um, I don't know the, the particular details of those, um, but I trust that there, there was a valid reason. I would say 99% of the time, the chair is going to be supportive, and I think that's important to realize that when you're providing feedback, that there's the potential, like the potential for the same thing I'm writing on a page, that it, it could become broader than just the relationship between the student and the instructor. Right? That's advice that we give TAs as well. Right? Um, the criticism should be constructive. Right? Um, it should not be personal into the point that you're a stupid idiot. And obviously that just makes sense. Right? Um, and recognizing, and I think Greg, you do this, you recognize that, you know what, I'm cranky. right? I've been up late marking, this paper is not as good as I think it is, and the tone that I'm reading it back is, mm -hmm. right? It's a, it's a self-awareness of it. I mean, just very briefly, because I know there was another question. Um, I'm also on the steering committee of the union, and um, you have academic freedom, right? So if you, yeah, if you do something which you should be called, that you should be calling the cupboard for, well, then that's, you, you shouldn't do that. So yeah, you, you never tell a student they're stupid. And you certainly don't do it on, you know, if you're being recorded. But it seems to me that if you're, you know, if you are sensible, then you have a record. So if the student complains, then you have a record. And if your chair is, decides to, then you go to the dean. If the dean doesn't satisfy and they, you're censured, then you go to the union. You file a grievance. But, you know, there's actually <laughs> a record there. So I think actually, now your point, I hadn't thought of that, it being, out into cyberspace? Well, if you're not comfortable with that, don't do this. I mean, it's the same but with the paper, you know. I, you know my, I, yeah. At the moment, I'm going through like, mm -hmm. to graduate level. Here's a comment on the paper. It's mm -hmm. incredibly laborious. And you know, it's mm -hmm. like, get sent into it as a PDF. 
that could end up where I do as well. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of problem. Mm -hmm. um, it could qualify maybe in the syllabus to say I use voice quarantine as a type of feedback, and uh, it's, these are my reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can also give students the option not to have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to suggest that if you somehow found a way to make it so they were downloadable, that's one other option. They could just play it in WebCT, and then after the course is over, you restrict their access, and then they only have access to it during that term. That's another option. Um, I was going to ask you if you ever have, um, I guess this depends on sort of how nervous you are being recorded, but have you ever had moments where you have to keep redoing a comment over and over because you mess up, or mm -hmm. does that add to a lot of timing and you have um, I'm fairly self-confident, so I haven't had to do that very much. Um, it's a lot easier in GarageBand than in this, because with this or the iPad, you can't, the program just, you pause and continue recording. Um, with GarageBand, you can go back, you can just see it, split it, you know, you can do whatever you want. I did have a funny uh, experience once, though, because I was working on a paper, and my girlfriend came over, and so I had to stop halfway through a paper. And the next morning, I started up again, and um, marking the paper. And then the doorbell rang, and I went to get the door. There's nobody there. And then I sat down. And I don't know what was I saying. Back it up again, and the doorbell rang again. I was like, "What is the invisible man ringing my door?" And I realized, "Oh, that was the doorbell from last night. That was on the recording." <laughs> so you have to be careful for ambient sound as well, right? I I thought it would be fun to mess with a student's head by. <laughs> listening to music while recording, but have a wildly different music, you know, every three or four seconds, right? But uh, that's a lot of work. Um, this is for hard copy edits. So do you ever consider an extension, like if you were to um, mark a soft copy of your essay and then use... Sorry, what's the difference? The difference would be, like, you could use, if we're talking about... Um, attaching comments to the PDF or whatnot. You could use some sort of lecture capture tool and actually, um, as you're going through, use a highlighting tool and then comment on that particular piece as you're going through, like the actual soft copy versus marking up the hard copy. It might just be another option. Oh, you mean like a, a, the video thing? Uh, yeah, sorry. Exactly. Oh, a software. Uh, um, it's funny you should say that. Um, I, I'm, I'm experimenting with this sort of thing um, I have um, I annotate PDF on the <clears throat> on the um, iPad, and I finally had victory over photocopying because I can't figure out how to use the new photocopiers because they're too smart. They you know when you photocopy a book, it wants to guess how big the book is and it won't let you. Anyway, so I discovered a digitization stand. It's like an enlarger, so I've been able to hook up my digital anyway a digital camera and click 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 and I've got so I'm lecturing on Job next week and I've digitized the book and I'm going through with I annotate PDF to to make my annotations you know rather than writing in my Bible which I think you can go to hell for I'm I'm writing on the side you know I mean I could photocopy it you know just do that but you could do the same thing on the student's paper yeah this is this is ultimately I'd like to have a an app where they submit a PDF and then you have a good interface where you can put your codes or whatever it is you want and then you press record and then they get the audio thing and then you send it back to them as an integrated PDF uh, thing but I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Decrease the app? <laughs> yeah, we'll see. You know, make a gazillion dollars, right? Um, none of you, don't edit this out, none of you can do it, it's my idea. <laughs> And without, without doing it to a PDF, you could also uh, have a video capture that doesn't capture from the cameras but captures what's going on on the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Camtasia exactly. is a good yeah. example. So we have Camtasia actually at our offices that we let people use, and it's a, a software that costs money, but okay. it works really well. Okay. Camtasia. Can you spell it? Yeah. C A M T A S I A. Mm -hmm. I think it might be pricey, yeah. Because I'm looking for something even a little, I, I teach journalism and I, I'm trying to find a way to cut down my mark YouTube because it's easily 60, right. 65 hours a week, some weeks. And they, my, my students are submitting video pieces. Mm -hmm. So I would mm -hmm. love to find a way, and I know there's got to be a way out there, mm -hmm. of commenting on their video while it's playing. Mm -hmm. Because I think that will, you know, sink in. I'm sure, um, I mean, Excuse me, I don't know what it is, but I'm sure you can just basically feed the video into a program like iMovie or something more sophisticated and just add a track. 
Yeah. You know, like a director's track. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, I, I guess the question then is, is that, is that too large a file even for something like WebCT to handle? I don't know. But journalism has gazillions of dollars. You could have like yeah. servants bringing the. What university are you talking about? <laughs> well, I would say like talk to the EDC because we're, we can work with you and develop a solution for that. So That'd be great. And I've also been in touch with other journals, uh, journals and props in the states who are using some other programs too. So yeah, hmm. because I think this, I, I was just curious. I know you kind of hinted at it, but what's your estimate as to how by how much your marketing time has decreased as a result of using this? Um, I used to take. My marking used to be like this. I would procrastinate for two weeks before I marked the first paper. I'd have 35 papers, let's say. I'd procrastinate for two weeks. It would take me a day to mark the first paper. Uh, on the second day, I would get about three papers done. Um, by, the, by the third or fourth paper, I was actually not getting up and making tea all the time, but it would take me about an hour, you know, so from the beginning to the end of the set of papers, I whittled the per paper time from 40 minutes to an hour down to about 10 to 15 minutes. Now it's taking me five, you know, some two to 10 minutes per paper with no procrastination time because I'm a, I, I love gadgets. So it's fun, you know? Uh, it, you know, the, the dread of, oh my God, you know, the, what, what did they say on page one? Well, the, the, this is Hermes and Athena, by the way, with the phoenix. Um, you know, because I'm 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 marking it up, right? I can remember what was on page one, so that dread is gone, and I know that it doesn't take me too long to do the comments. So, overall time, I would say it's been reduced to it would take me a month to get a set of papers back to now I can turn them around in a couple of days, right? I mean, last last semester I had I had an assignment I uh, gave it to them every two weeks, and that was only in one class. I had ten separate assignments actually because I had. Because we, you know, we had the little writing boot camp in the, the second year class too, so I'm hoping to have to eliminate that. I mean, I was going mad. I, I, I was grading 65 hours. I was teaching 65 hours a week, um, but that's only because I had 10 separate assignments. But I was able to mark 10 separate assignments in one semester, and with an average uh, about 30 to 40 papers per assignment. So what is that? Three to 400 papers? That's a lot. You, you were to ask. Yeah, it's great. I was just wondering if we could see the batch upload. Sure. The mm, yeah. Do you want to? Sure. Okay, let me get rid of this beautiful picture. Preview. Is your course is in the saving time. Sure. Okay, I'm in there. Yep. Just as a heads up, on March 18th, uh, we're holding a LMS open house where we'll be showcasing all three different products as well as answering any questions or giving you an opportunity to see what we're looking at. Um, yeah. So, okay. So, no. so, the trick is this thing called WebDAV, is you have to find it. That's the first trick. So, inside your course, you'll have a set thing called My Settings. And so two options. It's not something I do every time. It's a content content manager. Come on. I'm sorry, it's not something I do every time. Dragon. Yeah. It's going to take me a little bit to figure it out because there's the web tab settings. No, that's Nails, Layout. I'm sure it's a profile. No. no. The perfect example of why this is a bad interface. <laughs> well, again, it, again, it's not something I do. No, it's not. Because each course has its own location and I'm looking for a URL. My settings. Channel. You're not currently in a course now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I shouldn't be in. See, it's my settings, right? Let's get back. There. See, this is where I want to be. Oh, hold on. Susie. Hmm? Sorry? Can you send it to us? Maybe? Yes, of course. How did you get there? So this is, I mean, my WebCT, yeah. my list of courses, and there's a course list okay. and I can edit the course list so I can oh, okay. hide and show courses out of this list okay. right oh, cool. now what I'm looking for I should just pull out our user manual that would help me no. 
no, this is not where it is either. Ryan, can you show me where web dev is hiding? Sure. Um, you're going to be in the same boat as I am? No. No, no mess. Okay. Uh, content manager. Oh, it's uh, specific to an individual class, not your file. Oh, so if we right. go into one, we just have to go to the file area. How do you get there? Uh, so if you just go into your course, yeah. and under build, there's a file manager. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and under this drop-down box, there's a web dev info. Thank you. And okay. it just gives you a URL. <clears throat> that basically on, on Mac, you connect to server, or on Windows, you map to PC, like map a network drive the same way you have access to your network drive in your classroom or on another person's computer. Um, so you would actually, because it's his course, he's going to need to log in. So now I copy and paste here. Mm -hmm. Connect. Okay. It's going to prompt you to enter in your WebCT login and password. You okay. only need to do this once. Uh -huh. It's going to put a folder on your desktop mm. of your course, and you'll see the folder structure inside, mm -hmm. and then you just drag and drop whatever folders you want. That's awesome. Um, these instructions are actually in our WebCT handbook if you don't have one and would like one to take away. It is both for Mac and PC in the handbook. And we can also email these instructions around. And it just keeps that folder synced? It doesn't keep it synced. Well, <clears throat> well the so the way. folder will be there, okay? When you disconnect, when you disconnect from the network, the folder will disappear off your, your, your computer, okay? And then uh, when you let's say you want to reconnect to the web dev, you can go in a Mac to recently connected servers, just double click on it, it would have kept your login credentials and the folder will reappear. So it's not a place you want to keep the, the primary copy of your files? No, because you're talking directly to the server, it's not storing it locally on your machine. It's not like a Dropbox in the sense where it's syncing, right? It's literally just mapping um, the folder temporarily to your computer. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Greg. My pleasure. So again, on March 18th, the LMS uh, Open House. And also, for those of you who have not participated in uh, and are interested, we, the EDC offers a faculty teaching certificate. Um, it's a 13-week, about 35-hour uh, course on teaching and that is going to be the registration is open for the spring session as well as the contract instructor teaching certificate again registration is open for that for the spring session so if that's something you're interested in you can find that off the EDC website